Today's lecture will be a continuation of the methods in neuroendocrinology, and I'll switch to the computer, and we'll start. Uh, this is methods 2A, and we now begin uh, discussing radial ligand uh, binding assays, specifically in this lecture uh, on the uh, <coughs> receptor types of assays, and therefore, of course, the radial ligand uh, binding. But first, we want to make a few points about uh, uh, chemical messenger or drugs uh, and their binding sites as we begin to uh, look a bit at their binding characteristics. <clears throat> so uh, we are obviously interested in only a specific type of a binding. It uh, doesn't do much good in science or uh, medicine to measure nonspecific uh, binding, so obviously there have to be some conditions to de determine and verify uh, that you are looking at a specific uh, receptor and a specific type of binding. So there's three criteria that should be satisfied in performing a binding uh, analysis study. The first is saturability. Obviously, if you have just so many sites to be bound in a sample, then if you add enough of the ligand that can bind to that, eventually uh, you will fill all of those. And then uh, specificity, as we said, is extremely important. You don't just want the molecule or the drug that you're dumping on uh, your sample or into your sample to be sticking to anything and everything. You want it just to be sticking to the, uh, the binding site of interest. And uh, as we know, the receptor dynamics are uh, binding and uh, <coughs> unbinding, so it is a reversible uh, reaction. We'll make some more points about each of these uh, in the next couple of slides. So the first of these, in considering the sites of drug uh, action properties of receptors, is the saturability. So as I said, there's a finite number of receptors either on a cell, if we're trying to put it into a biological perspective, you're rarely going to be studying just one cell uh, in a, a homogenate or other type of procedure. There's in situ uh, binding assays, as we'll see as well. It's, so it's typically uh, per weight of tissue or uh, gram of, of protein uh, that you would see as the units of reporting the number of receptors. But from this sense, it's the perspective that you know, we have a sample and there should be just a limited number of receptors within that. So um, this would be revealed by a saturable uh, binding curve. So obviously we're going to have to have uh, a ligand that we know has a specificity. Uh, if we're going to use a, a known ligand of a known specificity and all of its properties to study the receptor, uh, this is the way that we'd be thinking about it rather than trust testing a new drug where we know everything about the receptor and we're testing the ability of the drug to interact with it, there's two ways of thinking of it there. But this perspective is uh, having a known drug with known uh, characteristics and we're evaluating uh, the receptors. So we obviously are going to have some type of marker on the ligand uh, in this case, as we're talking about radio ligand binding assays, obviously the ligand is labeled with a radioactive marker that we can detect through whatever uh, methods uh, they're uh, depending upon the uh, radioactive molecule, whether it's tritiated, you might use scintillation counter if it's tritiated or if it's iodinated, giving off a, a gamma particle, then you can use uh, a gamma counter, but <clears throat> either way you have to quantitate the amount of radio labeled ligand that you have. So it comes to the same thing like we've talked about before, you're mixing things together, some gets bound and some is not bound, you have to have a way of separating it, we won't get into the details of that method, and then you are looking at how much of your radio, li li radio labeled ligand is bound in your sample. <clears throat> So there's a lot of variables that you can change, the amount of protein uh, in the sample or the amount of drug, uh, the amount of labeled drug versus unlabeled drug, as we will see, become important uh, in this. So you have a way of measuring how much is bound and you can generate a binding curve, as we'll see, and it should plateau. 
So as you add more and more of the drug, <clears throat> the number of molecules bound should reach a point where no more can be bound. So we should be picturing this graph in our mind right now, and we'll look at it uh, in a, a bit later. <clears throat> So at this point of the plateau, the maximum binding, obviously is going to reflect the number of binding sites in the sample. Next then, the specificity, it, it seems quite obvious, uh, and indeed it is. Uh, demonstrating it methodologically uh, and experimentally might be a bit more challenging, but uh, as a concept, it's uh, quite obvious. So it depends upon, as we know, we've always talked about uh, the uh, receptor uh, ligand interaction as the lock and key. So if, it's, uh, if the structure of your ligand isn't just exact uh, as the, the natural ligand uh, <clears throat> or have some characteristic that maybe makes it a little bit better than the key to fit into the lock, uh, then you really can't expect a high degree of specificity. So the higher the fidelity of the chemical structure of your ligand to that uh, stoichiometric area, uh, if you remember your chemistry, uh, and we challenge ourselves in this class all the time in our chemistry, uh, the stoichiometric interaction of the binding site and the ligand are what are really important. And that's what this structurally uh, obviously is referring to, and it has to be complementary to the receptor. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that the ligand has to create exactly, for example, the amino acid sequence uh, that uh, presents itself, just has to present the appropriate chemical environment that matches it uh, to the highest degree of fidelity, and you can have a high specificity. Obviously, we're, uh, in our mind, we should be calling up the word affinity, because the closer we get to the ideal <clears throat> um, structure, chemical structure, to interface with the binding site, the more the binding site should like it, so we should have a higher affinity. And we'll see that term shows up as well. So you can demonstrate that by using a series of drugs <clears throat> uh, with uh, varying slightly in the chemical structure, and then you'll see those uh, affinity uh, differences <clears throat> Uh, with uh, and dependent upon the different chemical structures. But if the drug is uh, optically active, uh, we recall uh, racemic versus, oh goodness, what's the other one? <laughs> Enantiomeric forms uh, of the molecules, the levo and the dextro. So if you've got a mixture of levo and dextro, uh, you're not going to have uh, as much binding because maybe only the levo the L uh, form of it, and remember the, the L and the R come from the uh, optical uh, characteristic of the drug. Does it bend the light to the left or the right? <clears throat> so that's what's being uh, mentioned here. <clears throat> so you can have the, uh, the isomeres. So the uh, enantiomeric form is when you have the mixture, and the racemic form is when you have just one of them in a pure form, uh, either the R or the L uh, form. So it's important to be able to recognize uh, in research literature <clears throat> uh, this, these terms and look for that R and the L or the RL or uh, <clears throat> whatever other designation uh, would give you that indication. And then immediately you start thinking about uh, how it impacts specificity and the affinity. <clears throat> And typically, in, in nearly every case that I recall encountering, uh, the L form has the higher affinity and the R form uh, has a much lower affinity and sometimes none uh, whatsoever. <clears throat> the uh, reversibility, then the drug should bind to the receptor and then <clears throat> dissociate in the non-metabolized form. So this is important because receptors are, are binding uh, molecules. They are not biologically active sites, such as the binding sites we might think of sometimes uh, for uh, <clears throat> the enzyme substrate interactions. But many of the, uh, the uh, kinetics are the same, so we'll see that we'll encounter many similarities. If you recall, you know, like the Michaelis-Menten <clears throat> equation uh, and saturation, uh, 
curves for uh, enzymes and their substrates, uh, many of the kinetics are very similar or the ways of thinking about the kinetics are similar when we think about receptor drug interactions and we'll look at uh, some of those in a moment. So just a couple of other points on receptor binding. The first is the intrinsic activity. We knew that affinity was coming. Uh, intrinsic activity uh, really means that there's some internal characteristic of the drug that is binding, of the ligand, uh, that must match, have a high fidelity to the endogenous or natural ligand. <clears throat> so if you are... Uh, when we see the word potency, we obviously are thinking of some type of bioassay or functional assay uh, rather than just a, a homogenous binding assay, but it's still the same. We, if it binds with a high affinity, then uh, <clears throat> we uh, would imagine that it would have a, a greater potency. And obviously the antagonist uh, would block this uh, and the natural ligand. Then affinity, we've seen several times already. It refers to the, the strength of binding. And I've been uh, uh, loosely defining affinity as how much the receptor, the binding molecule or protein in most cases, likes to bind the ligand. Well, that actually is defining avidity, A-V-I-D-I-T-Y, um, and the avidity refers to the receptor and how much it actually likes to bind and therefore have a high affinity for uh, the ligand. So there is a difference uh, in the, the perspective. The ligand can have a high affinity for the receptor that has a high avidity for that ligand. It just avidly likes to bind uh, that particular chemical environmental structure the stoichiometry again. So the, the optimal stoichiometry produces the highest avidity of the receptor and the highest affinity uh, of the binding of the ligand to the receptor. And it's when we get to this uh, statement of affinity and understanding how much they like to bind each other and how strongly they bind to each other that we start getting some constants. <clears throat> And these constants, as we remember, always have a K. So there's a KD that is the dissociation constant. Um, and we saw this already when we talked about uh, the uh, receptors. Uh, and we looked at steroid receptor uh, analysis uh, for uh, cortisol and corticosterone uh, and a few others in a, pr a prior lecture. And we mentioned the uh, dissociation constant there. We'll look at it a bit more uh, in detail here in this lecture now. So, um, and I think I got this part mixed up when we did it last time. If you have a high KD, a high dissociation uh, uh, constant, that means it's, it's very difficult to dissociate. Then you have, I'm doing it again. If you have a high KD, KD is a concentration, so that means you have to have a high concentration um, to get the, the binding, so you think that there's a lower affinity. A low KD uh, means that it'll bind very tightly at low concentrations and therefore have a high affinity. And the reason that I keep getting this reversed uh, is that the KD is actually the dissociation constant and in this lecture, we want to talk about it in relationship to the Ka, the affinity constant, <clears throat> um, and see that there is truly a reciprocal uh, interrelationship. So remember that uh, the, the constants are, in, uh, con are units of concentration. <clears throat> uh, so let's begin thinking more about the kinetics of the affinity. Uh, we can determine a maximal binding. Uh, you see a Vmax is shown here, and immediately in your mind, this uh, V should seem out of place because the V actually applies to enzymatic reactions. But as I said, the kinetic analyses are the same. In pharmacokinetics, uh, this actually gets replaced by a B, as you will see, to re uh, actually reflect uh, 
maximal binding. But a very similar analysis uh, is performed uh, as in uh, estimating Vmax and uh, you end up with a plateau. <coughs> uh, maximal velocity of the reaction uh, is the Vmax and saturation of the enzyme. And in Bmax, uh, it's the maximal binding that, as we see in this graph uh, that we'll analyze a little bit more closely, uh, it, it reflects the number of receptors. So first, before going on to this uh, general graph, let's remind ourselves of Avogadro's number. <clears throat> and it is 6.062 times 10 to the 23rd. And Avogadro's number, as you recall, is the number of molecules in one mole. And we recall that a molar solution is one mole per liter. <clears throat> and all the discussions that we're going to be having, we need to preempt uh, these uh, discussions with this point, are based upon a single binding site per receptor. So let's think back about when we looked at the uh, nicotinic cholinergic receptor, two binding sites on that. So the kinetics are going to be very different. It's going to show uh, a dependency on lig ligation of both of those uh, receptor sites per receptor to reach saturation. So our uh, just basic foundation discussion that we're going through is assuming one binding site per receptor uh, complex. So therefore, when you end up knowing the molar concentration uh, for any of these points, critical points that we'll be looking at, <clears throat> then using Avogadro's number, the number of molecules in a mole, you do the calculation and you can calculate how many ligand molecules were in that concentration and a one-to-one -one ratio stoichiometric uh, equivalency to the number of receptors. <clears throat> and that's why this uh, saturation of binding sites, the Bmax, can uh, be a reliable index of the number of receptors. Obviously, many experimental conditions, uh, a variety of things can impact that and keep it uh, imperfect so it's always an index of or an estimate of uh, the number of receptors. <clears throat> so remember we talked about receptor upregulation, receptor downregulation. So uh, in order to assess if either of those two has truly occurred, uh, you would have to get two different B maxes, and we'll uh, take a look at that in a moment. Or there might be different numbers of receptors in different areas of the brain, as we will see. So let's go on now that we have appreciation for Avogadro's number and how it applies to all this. And remember that our constants are going to be concentrations. So this brings our attention to the x-axis. Here we see 10 to the minus 11 to uh, 10 to the minus 6th. So 10 to the minus 6th is more concentrated than is 10 to the minus uh, 11. Uh, 10 to the minus 9 is nanomolar. 10 to the minus uh, 6 is micromolar, so this is one micromolar and one nanomolar. Uh, you'll have to come up with the other numbers. <laughs> Nomenclature on down through. I was looking for 12. I think that's picomolar, right? And then 15 is femtomolar. So those are the, the typical ones that there is a term uh, that exists for it. Otherwise, we use the scientific notation of just uh, 10 uh, to the uh, negative uh, power if we don't have the name, micro, uh, nano, and uh, 12, pico, minus 15, femto, F-E-M-T-O. <clears throat> so there is a molar concentration range of the ligand uh, that is involved in these uh, types of studies. You can't just use one concentration because it doesn't really give you any dynamics. If we're studying pharmacokinetics, it's got to be a dynamic process. And in this particular uh, graph uh, for uh, affinity, uh, we see that uh, we have uh, the amount of the ligand bound to the receptor. It might be counts per minute uh, or uh, converted to uh, something else, but it is some reflection of amount bound or ratio bound uh, to the receptor. And as we start going through these different graphs, what you have to realize is the Y and the X axes are going to change, and each time they change, they give us slightly different information. But this is the basic starting point to calculate the KD, 
The KD uh, of the ligand is 1 over the affinity. So this is this reciprocal association that we had mentioned before, uh, but there are different approaches for uh, actually um, evaluating KD and KA. But basically, this type of uh, a study and a graph can be produced. And of course, you're obviously keeping the amount of your homogenate, the milligrams of protein, constant. And the only independent variable uh, that you are changing is the molar concentration of your radio-labeled ligand. And then you get the readout, the quantitation of the uh, bound ligand uh, to put on the y-axis. And when this is graphed out, there's usually a, a, quite a linear portion, and then obviously it begins to plateau at some concentration. And the KD is actually the concentration at which you get 50% of the maximum binding. So that is uh, the KD. And this, as I said, it, it always uh, befuddles me a little bit uh, because it's the dissociation constant, but we're really looking at the binding to the receptor, so it just seems uh, the reverse to me. But that's, that's fine. This, uh, I always get through it somehow and just remind myself that the, K, the KD is the concentration at which you get 50% of the maximum binding uh, and the Ka, the affinity constant, is the reciprocal of that. So the simplest uh, case, as we said, is what we're looking at. Receptor drug interaction with just one binding site on the receptor for the ligand under investigation or used in the uh, study uh, it can be described by the law of mass action as follows. So if you remember your biochemistry, Law of mass action was always applied to the evaluation of enzymes. And here, of course, we're looking not at uh, uh, substrate enzyme, an enzyme substrate complex that goes on to uh, enzyme product. This is re receptor and drug going on to form the complex of re ligated receptor by the drug, uh, and it is reversible. And the KD actually is going in this direction, the dissociation constant. And <clears throat> therefore, the KD uh, is equal to uh, the dissociated form, how much is dissociated uh, versus how much is ligated. So the KD is the equilibrium dis dissociation constant. Again, as with any enzyme uh, assay kinetic analysis, you have to have it at equilibrium, and again, that's the same here. So you have to mix them together and let them uh, go, stay together for a period of time, incubate, until you have everything bound that can be possibly bound. And that's when you have equilibrium. It's on the receptor as often as it's off the receptor, and this is that reversibility. So <clears throat> you're just as likely to find uh, the ligated as the unligated uh, with reference to the, the drug being present. <clears throat> so um, the others uh, on this key are obvious. So a measure of the affinity of the receptor for the drug is given by the equilibrium dissociation constant. In order to make these concepts useful, an equation relating the number of receptors present and the affinity of those receptors for the drug to the measurable parameters must be developed. So the following derivation attempts to relate the total concentration of receptors in the K sub D, the dissociation constant, uh, equilibrium uh, dissociation constant, to the concentration of the free drug and the receptor drug complex. So we're not trying to become experts on all these formula and everything. We just go through it so that it puts an image in our mind to help us understand and appreciate this uh, ever more so. So now we see the R sub T, and again, these brackets around here, we remind ourselves that that means concentration. So the total receptor concentration equals the uh, concentration of receptor that is not ligated, the unbound, ver plus the bound or ligated receptor. So the total concentration of receptors 
brackets R sub T is by definition the sum of the bound and the free receptor concentrations. <clears throat> so from that definition, a little bit of algebraic uh, uh, moving around <clears throat> with the, uh, the KD uh, calculation, uh, you get the uh, concentration of RD equals uh, R times D over uh, K sub D. And we put that all together a little bit. <clears throat> um, and a saturation function can be defined as followed. Man, you can work your way through that if you want to. But anyway, what it comes down to is we see that uh, we can get an affinity uh, constant <clears throat> by uh, ultimately having the drug, unbound drug, the free drug concentration uh, over the free drug, drug concentration uh, plus the KD, so in essence, the reciprocal uh, of the, the KD. So this is uh, an equation for simple bimolecular interaction, one ligand, one binding site molecule, one molecule with one binding site uh, between the receptor and the drug, and is true only following equilibration of all the species, and in practice, receptor drug interactions are uh, typically much more complicated than this, as we would predict, <coughs> and uh, just the same, the principles used to drive the relationships for the equilibrium state are still the same. This uh, approach can be applied. So let's get away from formula and uh, take a look at another type of graph. Let's look at our axes. Uh, you might not be able to see the y-axis here. This is a bound drug, the RD. <clears throat> so it's uh, similar to what we had seen on the y-axis of the previous uh, graph, but look at what's on the uh, x-axis now. This is free drug. So the this is uh, graphing bound over free, and it reflects uh, the the KD uh, as uh, again uh, the cons the one half of the <coughs> uh, maximal binding. And in this case, with this type, uh, the, the ratio that you reach at saturation uh, really is ultimately would be 1. And so you can, you can see that here. The total receptor bound should be uh, 1. <clears throat> so we have two lines on this graph, the red and the green. And this is a graph that displays affinity. So the question we're asking is, which of these two have a greater affinity? <clears throat> And the, the quickest lesson I'll give you is the, the line on the graph farthest to the left is the one with the highest affinity. It, look at the slope, uh, the steep slope of the, um, the more linear portion uh, at the lower uh, amounts of free drug. So what this means is when you add drug, a lot of it gets bound to the receptor very quickly so that at low uh, <clears throat> amounts of the drug that you're adding, uh, m most of it's going to go straight to the receptor and spend more time there, be bound more tightly so there's a higher affinity. <clears throat> if this was a study where we did something uh, to our biological system, and we wanted to test if there was any change in the affinity of the receptors in a certain area. And if this was our control and this was our treated, we would say that the curve shifted to the left. Therefore, there was an increase in affinity. And look, the uh, affinity uh, is reflected by the KD, as we said. The KD is a smaller number um, for the uh, curve with the higher affinity. And what we're doing is we're saying, well, one is uh, the, uh, the level for total receptor, and at 50% of that, 0 0.5 uh, on the y-axis, we come down and the amount of free drug is 0 0.5. For the green curve at the 0 0.5, we come over, drop down, and we get 2. So the higher the KD, 
the lower the affinity because the affinity is the reciprocal. So uh, 1 over 0.5 is a higher number than 1 over 2. <clears throat> Another graph uh, is shown here, and this is uh, the bound drug on the y-axis with the, the uh, log uh, distribution of the free drug, and this might be the, the type of graph that would be seen more uh, um, typically. <clears throat> and in this, the relationship of the concentration of the, the bound drug to free drug is plotted on the semi-logarithmic scale. And this shows more clearly any differences in affinity between the two binding curves. So the, the KDs are going to be the same, the RTs are going to be the same. See, so this brings them both to one. And so when we uh, come to the point 0.5, <coughs> we uh, should get, um, again, this is a log scale, so it would be uh, still the, the very similar. Yeah, so. 10 to whatever 0 0.25 uh, <clears throat> should give us the uh, the 2 and here down uh, this should give us the, the 0 0.5. <clears throat> so this is usually what you'll see and then the left shift again we're pretending we're doing an experiment where this is controlled this is treated the left shift is very obvious so we would have a fourfold uh, increase in affinity that would accompany our fourfold decrease in KD. So uh, again, we are uh, considering the pharmacodynamics of the single ligand uh, receptor binding, <clears throat> and that produces uh, this type of a curve, as we saw on the semi-logarithmic uh, scale. So the form of the typical ligand binding and dose response curves follows from the law of the mass action. It can be mathematically derived as we saw. The formation of the ligand receptor complex is a function of the amount of ligand, the number of receptors, and the association and dissociation rate constants. <clears throat> and uh, the equation is uh, derived for you uh, in this area here. And we won't go through that. You can read this uh, on your own. <clears throat> and this is uh, a widely applicable uh, function for uh, a large number of ligand receptor interactions. Gives a theoretical basis for standard dose response analyses. <clears throat> and the ligand doses are usually expressed as the log dose. And receptor binding or biological effect is normally plotted on the linear scale. And the empirical data conforming this uh, to a theoretical, theoretically derived function have particularly strong intrinsic validity. So this is a major part of <clears throat> what, we, what you would need to establish if you're trying to perform a dose response uh, study as well. <clears throat> if you don't have enough <clears throat> doses and it doesn't demonstrate this type of property, then uh, you would not have the intrinsic validity and uh, the data would be questionable. <clears throat> so here is a, an instance where we have three different drugs, drug A, B, and C, and this is a simulation. <clears throat> and we note log concentration on the x-axis, percent maximum binding, <clears throat> excuse me, on the uh, y-axis. And of course, you are asked uh, which drug has the highest uh, affinity. And obviously, the curve farthest to the left, the drug A has the highest affinity, and drug B has the intermediate affinity, and drug C has the lowest affinity <clears throat> in this analysis. So the ligand uh, concentration is on the x-axis, uh, as we said. And um, so the, the curves look very much the same. So the, the same effect can be produced by each ligand. But the amount of ligand necessary to obtain any given level 
of effect is dependent on its dissociation constant. And this is where <coughs> uh, I want you to gain an appreciation from this information of how <coughs> the doses of drugs should be uh, selected. Uh, the KD <coughs> for a drug is a concentration and uh, <coughs> if it's not a physiological molecule you don't know what the physiological concentration range would be so you can't determine if you're creating a physiological uh, concentration at the cells that you're investigating. <coughs> if it's a, a synthesized drug uh, then you have to relate to uh, the receptor and focus on affinity and assume that the endogenous ligand has a very strong affinity uh, for the receptor. So uh, you want to use a drug that has uh, a very uh, good affinity, doesn't always have the best affinity that you'd like it to have, but you have to decide what concentration of that to use. And the KD50 is uh, a safe one to use because it should be the concentration at which you get 50% maximal binding of your receptors. So you're not over bombarding your biological system by using the concentration for the KD50. In biological assays, the KD uh, uh, is, and I'm starting to say KD50, if it's just KD, then it is the KD50, but you can calculate other KDs. But anyway, uh, in a bioassay, KD is defined as the concentration at which you get half maximal response to the, uh, the drug that is being added. So this is the way that we see the transition from an analytical assay to a functional assay using the KD. The KD of any particular drug is a crucial uh, <clears throat> uh, kinetic property to know if you're going to use that drug uh, in research. <clears throat> and if you're going to do a dose response, say you have the, the uh, dynamics for the receptor binding, the functional, excuse me, the analytical assay, and you want to do, perform a, bi a functional bioassay then you know what concentrations to work with. You may start at the 50, the KD50 concentration, uh, and then uh, go down from there or up from there or on either side of it. Uh, it gives you a uh, point of focus uh, to know um, that there is a certain predictability in the behavior of the ligand and receptor interaction. Well, it doesn't just stop there. Uh, there are further analyses, excuse me, of the ligand binding, and if we note uh, the slope of another type of plot, the scattered plot, uh, it will equal uh, the negative uh, K sub A, which equals negative 1 over KD, the negative reciprocal of the KD. <clears throat> so we're moving to a point of saying we can get KD, if we have KD, we have a, a reliable estimate of the uh, affinity. So the, and as we'll see, the scattered plot switches things around. So now that we have, now we're going to have a slope uh, that decreases as we increase on the, x val on the x axis. So the Ka is the association constant and is proportional to the binding affinity. And the Kd is the association constant, as we said. So in the scattered analysis, <coughs> uh, the equation is uh, R over C equals minus KAR plus NKA. We're not expecting ourselves to remember any of this stuff, but going through it, it makes points to help us understand the dynamics of the methodology, what we can get from these uh, reports that use these methodologies, and the practical aspects of thinking about the biological systems and how experiments would be performed. So this R is the ratio of the binding sites occupied versus the total number of binding sites available. So you have to have all these other calculations before you can come up with this R. The C is the concentration of the non-bound ligand. And N is the number of binding sites per molecule. So this equation 
lets us jump into uh, more than one analyses of receptors that have more than one uh, binding sites per molecule. So here's a, a very illustrative uh, sketch of a sketcher uh, plot, <clears throat> bound versus free or bound over free, uh, the ratio of bound to free over bound. <clears throat> so the x-axis is the amount bound, the y-axis is the ratio of bound to free, and you end up with a, a slope, uh, a negative slope where uh, as the amount bound increases, the ratio of bound to free uh, decreases. And uh, where this scattered analysis slope uh, crosses the uh, x-axis, the x-intercept, that tells us it's an index of the number of receptor sites. And the slope, as we said, is the negative Ka, uh, the affinity constant. Since this line is going to have a negative slope uh, to get a Ka, which should be uh, the a positive value, we have to take uh, the inverse sine of it. <clears throat> so this is a, an illustration of the scattered analysis, and it uh, is showing the ratio of bound to free versus bound graphed against bound on the x-axis, and uh, we get the uh, negative relationship and negative slope, <clears throat> and uh, the slope of that line gives us the uh, affinity constant, and this uh, is linearized, so then the y equals mxb, our old friend, uh, where m is the slope, <clears throat> the equation for a linear line, y equals mx plus b, m is the slope, uh, so M equals the uh, negative Ka, and the x-intercept uh, reflects the number of receptor sites. So I obviously am going over that twice, and uh, you can expect to see that illustration on the exam, right? <clears throat> so the dissociation constant is a useful measure to describe the strength of binding between the receptors and their ligands. Another example is an ant antibody and antigen binding. So uh, there's radioimmunoassays uh, that are uh, based basically on the same kinetics. The binding of uh, molecules to proteins are what we're thinking about uh, in this context to generalize it uh, much more. <clears throat> so the uh, KD for the antigen antibody binding reaction is anywhere from 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 11 molar, uh, <clears throat> and uh, 10 to the minus 7 is equivalent to 0.1 micromolar, uh, <clears throat> back to what we had talked about before, and then converting that to 100 nanomolars. So how quickly can you convert from uh, scientific notation to uh, the uh, micromolar or picromolar and getting your uh, decimal points in the right place and then quickly moving those decimal points to convert it to nanomolar. <clears throat> For convenience, uh, call the receptor A and its ligand B. The interaction of A and B will involve them being together, the product and apart, reactant. And the strength of this interaction will be the balance between A and B, or on, and A and B, or off. And this relationship can be written as K1 is the rate of dissociation, and K2 is the rate of association. <clears throat> I took this, obviously, from a site where uh, it was enzyme kinetics, but what it uh, reminds us of is that the K1 <coughs> uh, is... Uh, in our reaction that we saw before, we had uh, the unbound re receptor plus drug and the receptor drug on the other side with arrows going in both directions. The arrow going uh, from the ligated state to the unligated state would be the K1, and the arrow going the opposite direction from unligated to ligated would be the K2. So this is the point being made here. Hopefully we all remember studying enzymes and biochemistry with the K1 and the K2. <clears throat> so these are used so that we can convert this linkage uh, to the right and to the left to an equal sign uh, 
And therefore, uh, if we uh, know when A and B equals A plus B equilibrium, it'll tell us the strength of binding, and it's uh, the usual complex AB. Uh, complex AB is more stable than the individual parts, and therefore at equilibrium, K2AB concentration equals K1 uh, concentration times uh, B. So this is just uh, reminding us uh, of some of that. Uh, I'm going to stop here and uh, leave you uh, to read over uh, this part, and uh, the next lecture we'll pick up with this table and uh, begin uh, applying some of this uh, knowledge that we've gained so quickly and brightly today. So I appreciate your time and attention. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. <clears throat>